the work that we're talking about is uh, drawing on funding from uh, the Canadian government as well as the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, plus uh, draws on core insights from my <coughs> time I spent at WIDER last fall as a visiting fellow. So we anecdotally observe that some states remain stuck in what we call a uh, high state of fragility despite copious amounts of aid, failure to reform. Uh, there are questions of fungibility. In other words, aid finds its way into avenues for which it was not intended. There are questions of selectivity and over and underfunding of these fragile states. Despite all these concerns, we observe that there are a number of states who remain stuck in what we call a fragility trap. Typically, we think of the fragility trap as uh, something where there are countries with pol poor policy environments, that the failure to effectively use, absorb aid, if you will, or where conflict and, po and poverty, or a combination of those two things, uh, are, is endemic. But it, the same is true for the most extreme cases. I mean, we, we, we find that this is typical of many fragile states, but can we say the same of, say, the top 10? This is the question we're going to investigate. Um, the, unfortunately, there's no sort of single causal relationship between highly trapped states and uh, those countries that, uh, that are less trapped. Uh, in other words, we find that there are instances of high levels of violence in trapped states and situations where they are not trapped. So we come to the conclusion that conflict intensity is probably not a core driver of fragility. Although much of the policy domain, I think, associates high levels of conflict with extreme cases of fragility, we're going to argue that that is not the case. So we're going to look at some of the common features of fragility, walk you through some of the empirical results. My co-author on a lot of this work is an economist, also at the School of International Affairs, uh, and then present some results in case studies in which we've tracked fragility over time. Uh, time permitting, we'll look at some of the implications of the differences across cases. Now, there are some core studies that focus on fragility traps. There was a study by the World Bank uh, which basically identified uh, poor property rights, high levels of violence, I believe low economic growth as core factors associated with fragility. But those authors really don't come up with an, a, a formal causal explanation. They don't have a theory. They're just simply saying these are things we think that are relevant to high levels of fragility. Similar, Chauvet and Collier in a very important study found that over a lengthy period of time that fragile states typically, uh, despite high levels of aid, um, simply don't adapt uh, reforms that are asked of them. And again, though, they don't, they don't come up with a reason as to why that behavior exists. So part of our goal is to explain why states remain trapped. And moving on, drawing from that analysis, what way can we develop effective targeted policy interventions that will move these states out of fragility? Moving forward, some of uh, our work will be conceptual, some of it is empirical, some of it is case study work. Our point is that we need to uh, ground our fragil fragility analysis in solid empirical uh, research, but also come up with a conceptual, conceptual framing that would allow us to compare cases, individual cases, and compare those individual cases with others over time. This gives us an opportunity to look at relative stages of fragility. In other words, to compare states that are stuck in fragility as well as those that have exited. Um, what we have found is that the literature is telling us that there's a significant focus on fragile states, especially those that remain trapped, but by and large the policies aren't having the intended effects. Why is that? Well, we came up with a, an empirical reference point, our own work, the Country Indicators for Foreign Policy Project, an open uh, source database which has uh, collected data for over, um, a project which has collected data for over 25 years now. We've tracked performance of states over time and we categorize them according to those that have been stuck in fragility trap, those that rank highly in our index, those that have moved in and out of fragility, that is they shift along the index from highly highly fragile to uh, out of the top 40, and those that have successfully exited, those states that have been out of the top 40 most fragile states for the last 10 years. And in doing so, we're able to come up with a, a list that we feel comfortable uh, 
making public, although there are some controversy here, some of you may take issue with some of these cases uh, for a variety of different reasons. This is driven largely by our own data work, so your results may vary according to the sources you draw on. But those states that have been remain, remain in our top 10 for the last 20 years or so uh, consist of the fr fragility trap countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Chad, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, Yemen, DRC, Somalia, Burundi, and Uganda. Those that have safely exited or stabilized and consist of Algeria, Bangladesh, Benin, Cambodia, Guatemala, Malawi, Mozambique, and those that have moved in and out of fragility are the, the list that you can see there. Now what we're going to do later on is focus on pairs of these cases in each category to explain why we think some states have exited and why others have not. But for now we're just going to do some conceptual brush clearing. So what we did is we looked at those countries that rank in our uh, most extreme cases of fragility, and that's the list that we produced. You can see uh, over a period of that 1980 to 20, 2014, that's the number of times they appeared in the top 20. So that's quite significant. And that's the time their fragility scores exceeded 6.5, which is in our ranking system, and I don't have time to detail it, uh, would be considered highly fragile. So you can see that Afghanistan outstrips all other countries in terms of extreme fragility. This despite the fact of the copious amount of aid that has received over the last 20 years. Burundi likewise also ranks uh, highly but has only scored 18 times in the top uh, in extreme cases of fragility or with, with a score of 6.5 or higher. Now, countries that may stand out to you as not being, in your estimation, fragility might include, for example, Pakistan. What? Pakistan? It's a middle-income country. How can it possibly be considered fragile? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Similarly, possibly Uganda, you might, you might take issue with. Nevertheless, those are the results that we've produced. Now, the question is, why do we think those countries are there? Well, we could look at any number of possible explanations, and this is all derived from the existing economic literature. Uh, poverty trap, you're probably familiar with, the conflict trap, the capability trap, and the legitimacy trap. Let me just briefly uh, explain each of these to you. Poverty trap, which has largely been debunked, um, suggests that the poor are simply not capable to accumulate and save enough money uh, to invest and therefore remain trapped in poverty. Uh, other factors including nutritional deficiencies, reduced wages and so on and continue to force the quality of life downward. While there is some reason to believe that some countries have experienced the poverty trap at a regional level, uh, large sample data suggests that it's empirically not true. Uh, and the question is, does this logic apply to our trap states, the ones that we just listed? Conflict tra trap essentially argues, and you've probably heard it because Paul Collier has spoken here many times, that those countries that fall into civil war are more likely to experience it in the future. Furthermore, those states that are caught up in regional conflict are likely to have their economies driven downward. Uh, the resource curse is often thought to be, anecdotally at least, uh, empirically related to the conflict trap. In other words, if you're uh, graced with the high level of resources, you're more likely to find yourselves engaged in conflict. De again, that's dependent on the region and so on. Capability trap is something we're less familiar with, as is the legitimacy trap. It is something that has been discussed and examined in detail by Pritchett and his authors, and a, a frequent contributor to studies at the World Institute for Development Economics Research. But here the reference points are isomorphic mimicry and premature load bearing, essentially that these states lack the ability to properly allocate resources to their populations. They lack the capabilities, in other words, although they may have the will, they may, may, they may function democratically, but the capabilities are lacking. Um, and that furthermore, donors impose certain demands on them, which creates what they call premature load bearing. Legitimacy trap is almost the opposite. Countries have access to resources, but as they accrue uh, and generate greater revenue, much of that doesn't trickle down and affect the population in a more positive way, creating essentially uh, weakness in the governance structure of the state and generates what we call lack of legitimacy. 
in, a, in other words, a disconnect between the population and the, and the gover government. Uh, so we have these four potential competing arguments, perhaps they're complementary. We've uh, proxied these with our data set so that we have some nominal measure of each, so that arguably each of these should be correlating highly with the, the uh, fragility trap. Our results, well, correlated, correlational here also produced through regression study, which and you can find in our working paper that was produced for, for the World Institute, but also a book that was forthcoming. You'll find greater detail and analysis in it. Essentially, what we find is that the poverty, uh, the poverty trap simply doesn't hold for the most extreme cases. Here we have a positive relationship. Now, if you look anecdotally, again, at our list of uh, most fragile states, we number amongst those a couple of middle-income fragile states, failed and fragile states, or MIFs, M-I-F-Fs. So that, it stands to reason that you know, Pakistan's going to drive that up. But in other words, as states become more fragile, at least those stuck in the, the bottom, poverty is not strongly associated with their, their characteristic of being trapped. Similarly, conflict for the, uh, the subsample is weakly correlated, not strong, as strongly correlated for all those that might be considered fragile. So we conclude on the basis of those two observations, at least, that probably the poverty trap doesn't resonate with the uh, fragility trap all, all that strongly, nor does the conflict trap. There may be some mild relationship there, but it's not strong. Where we get into some interesting relationships is in government effectiveness and voice and accountability essentially measures of legitimacy, the ability of a, of a government to effectively allocate resources, provide public goods, and in turn, in a reciprocal way, uh, be supported by the people. I guess this is the belief system that our keynote was speaking of earlier, although he, I don't think he parsed that out in great detail. I think this is the supportive belief system that is functional in, in uh, many states and lacking in the most fragile states. And is the legitimacy trap, I think, where we want to focus our attention for a couple reasons. One is it's largely neglected and poorly understood, and it's difficult to do, uh, to fix, because it typically policy instruments are designed for either improving the economy or reducing conflict, for example. So I'm not going to belabor the results here. I've just sort of, sort of said them in, it's in, a, in, a, in a summary form. So what I'm going to do in the brief time that I have available to me is to move on to our case studies uh, and see if we can tease out some of the great, more important implications of the, of the differences between those that are trapped and those that are, uh, have successfully exited. So for our type one or trapped states, we have Yemen and Pakistan. Type two, in and out, we call them. Those that are moving in and out of fragility. Uh, Mali and Laos, and type three, Bangladesh and Mozambique. I'll simply, for purposes of simplicity, refer to graphs uh, that capture baskets of indicators associated associate with authority, legitimacy, and capacity, which are proxies for the things I talked about earlier, the conflict trap, and so on. We'll look at main inflection points and try to de determine why there have been shifts in and out of fragility for some countries while there hasn't been the same for others. So in, in looking at the common elements, we find that all six cases that I just uh, identified have experienced conflict at some point in their 35-year window. Of, of course, a couple of those have been extreme war while others have not. All have struggled with democracy. Some are, some are uh, nominal democracies. Some are hybrid states, some are quasi-functional backsliding democracies. Nevertheless, there is some evidence of democracy in at least three of the six. Now, most importantly, all six have experienced growth at some point in their 35-year history. In fact, Mali was an aid darling. Um, Pakistan, tremendous growth. Yet we still classify it as a trap state. Why? Well, let's look at pa Pakistan's fragility ranking in relative to other countries. We see, if we take as that baseline average, that Pakistan has moved in and out of the top 20 over that time period. It spent, by our estimation, more time below the line than above, putting it in trapped status category. Now, it is moving up, and who knows what the current government will achieve, 
But our suggestion is that it has remained trapped for a sufficiently long time that we can conclude that it has serious structural issues. Our trend line with the upward line suggesting increasing levels of fragility and associated with our subset categories, authority, legitimacy, and ca capacity also indicate that Pakistan has struggled. Yemen, as you know, has gone through sporadic uh, cataclysmic upheavals, uh, notwithstanding the most recent case, which we don't cover in this data. But there has been a general upward shift in its fragility scores over time. And by and large, it spent more time below the line, making it extremely fragile than above. Why? Well, what we found is three things. Lethal and vicious feedback loops in which the shoring up of authority structures, in other words, the clamping down on civil and political rights, which simply leads to more uprising rebellion, which in turn leads to more clamping down. So in other words, an op instead of an opening up of society, we get a closing down. Elite bargaining, essentially elites conspire to seek out rents, either from the aid community or from a variety of different other sources, including military and development assistance, uh, Yemen, lack of control over ungoverned spaces and very weak patron-client relationships, and ult ultimately a minimal commitment to reform, an inability to effectively implement reform because the elites are constrained by and non-autonomous actors who are held back by the constituents they represent. I don't mean the, elected uh, the electoral population, but rather the people to which they are beholden. Moving on to Mali, because they don't have a lot of time and you can access this data through our working paper, as I said er earlier, you can see Mali has moved in and out of the fragility line, uh, putting it in what we call in and out status. And its, trend its uh, upward trend suggests increasing levels of fragility over time. Oops, and I just lost my slides. And there's Laos. Similar kind of problem, but not quite as severe. Um, Legitimacy scores being incre increasing significantly in the last five years or so. So what makes these countries moving, what, suggests, what is suggestive of these countries moving in and out of their uh, high levels of fragility? Well, they, more than any other country in our study, they emulate uh, forms of democratization reform without actually implementing that reform. Mali probably more than any other country in our case study. A country that has claimed to implement aid reform and de democratization, but has failed to do so. In combination with an inability to control un undergoverned spaces, and I nuance this a bit more in our paper, I know it's problematic. Uh, there's a, ultimately a loss of control over territory and loss of revenue associated with that. Keep in mind that one of the decisions by the Mali elite was to decentralize and also weaken the military for fear that they, the government would experience another uh, coup. Well, the net result of that was a fairly weak uh, state apparatus, opening up the opportunity for incursion of Tuareg rebels in the north. But long before that was a weakening of the state structure in the northern hinterlands. Laos, in similar ways, is, is weak, but its rent-seeking elites largely benefit from the growth of its neighbors, Vietnam and China and so on. And so there has been some, some shift of this country outwards out of uh, fragility, and there's, if there's good news here, it is probably that Laos will be dragged along with its regional neighbors out of fragility, whereas Mali is probably likely to fall back into it. Um, now we come to our success stories, and perhaps success should be in quotations, because there's a great deal of debate as to whether we've captured these states effectively, and one of our speakers may <coughs> take issue with the way we've characterized Mozambique. Nevertheless, we do consider these countries to have, have, have successfully exited fragility. You can see that Bangladesh in particular has moved clearly out of that top 40 ranking uh, significantly, and it, won't, it only really falls back into it when there's an election and there's some contestation uh, and high levels of violence between the elected elites. Um, and its trends, not nearly as promising. Here you can see down the trends during the post-election period. Um, but by and large, not stellar news, but certainly good news is that this country has, is now has a GDP per capita greater than Pakistan, its neighbor, which if you think where this country was, in fact, both of these countries locked in civil war, 
just prior to the onset of our four or five year period. And you can't imagine the last likely candidates to find their way out of the building of the Mozambique and Bangladesh. Mozambique's story got nearly as good, and indeed you can see that downward dip in the last five years uh, towards increasing levels of fragility. And, uh, but where it has probably done better is in terms of legitimacy with the opening up of the political process, but capacity uh, continues to struggle to pass the reference to economic development. So why have these countries succeeded well, whereas the others have not? There has been commitment to reform amongst the elites. Essentially, we get a process in Bangladesh of successful civilianization, keeping in mind that uh, for all intents and purposes, the bureaucratic authoritarian state, much like Pakistan itself. Uh, but there has been an opening up of the political process. What's most important in Bangladesh case, in my estimation, is that there's been greater inclusion of participants in the political process. And despite what our keynote said today, forms of what we would call virtuous corruption, in which money has certainly been spent uh, un unwisely, um, perhaps through bribes and so on, but that money finds its way back into the economy. So as long as there isn't capital flight, that money is contributing to country growth, or so the story goes. In addition to uh, that commitment to reform, and certainly saw it in Mozambique's case, post-peace post, uh, process, uh, opening up massive transformation of political orientation, there has been complementarity and substitution in civil society organizations in the case of Bangladesh, filling in gaps where government uh, appears to tread or is incapable of engaging, particularly with respect to poverty reduction. Um, are these countries resilient? That's our question here. There are constraints in both cases. Surely patron-client relationships are holding back and from becoming a fully democratic society. Corruption is also remains a huge issue there. Human capital, I think, is a key driver for this country. If you want to call it a brief system, Certainly there seems to be a commitment in this country that this is a country that can succeed and has appears to have been uh, supported in doing so by the international community. Mozambique, probably a less positive uh, ending given that there are emerging north-south divides and increasing uh, loss of accountability which are weakening the overall economic gains this country has made. So what do we take from this? Traps occur when a state fails to establish strong legitimacy, even, even in the face of improved capacity. You can have a strong economy, but if your government isn't legitimate in the eyes of the people, the world suffer. And we've seen that in the most extreme cases of Pakistan and Yemen. So legitimacy for us holds the key. The risk non-trap states face is the closure of the political system, even when economic growth is achieved. So you have to have that balance between economic growth and strong political uh, structures which are open and accountable and representative. I know it sounds perhaps uh, easy to say, but that relationship between state and society is absolutely essential to creating resilience. Um, more specifically, with respect to isomorphic mimicry, you need to look closely at how local elites interact with national elites. Are they on the same page? Is rent-seeking working to uh, subvert the activities of the national state apparatus at the local level? Well, this remains important for Mali, where we see a lot of localized rent seeking development community, which is not entrenched in the larger state apparatus. I'm going to wrap it up here with implications for policy. Why reforms don't work in trapped states? Leaders can simply perpetuate their gains uh, if they're able to survive with a small support base. They tie their own benefits to the welfare of benefits and those who uh, benefit from their particular policies. Even if the state lacks the overwhelming ability to affect change, they will not, the elites will not affect change if they don't have the economy to do so. They're the only particular sector of society. This is crucial to understanding Pakistan's stagnation. And I'm skeptical that the current leader can actually implement reform because I think he's too up in the machinations of elite interests. Uh, the elites, in this case, are largely those who are unaccountable. They're not elected. And without being held account 
to account, uh, they have no flus and infecting change that benefits them and not the larger population. So what do we do with all this? We need to look at the clear disconnect between the desire for reform and the allocation of aid. Uh, in particular, we, the implication is that aid needs to focus more on legitimate governance, whether it's uh, indigenous or otherwise, and see whether or not elites are actually acting in, a, in the interest of the local population. Indigenous systems of governance, in other words, are absolutely crucial. We need to look at the output side as well. Ultimately, is aid having an effect that it's intended? Is service delivery improving? Because ultimately, service delivery will be a key component in determining whether or not the state is acting in the legitimate interest of the population. We can parse that in a number of different ways. Uh, and then finally, talk to the population who surveys, find out how they feel about the, the governance structures in place. Do they feel that they're being treated unfairly? Is there an inequitable distribution of resources? You may get different viewpoints depending on the country you're examining. One would hazard yes that a more positive upbeat perception would exist in Bangladesh as opposed to Mali. So I'll end it.